Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Isabel J. Rodriguez. I use they, them pronouns. I am an astrophysicist by training. I recently graduated from Oregon State University with my master's degree, and I am currently the communications and data specialist here at PDXWIT. So it's Black History and Futures Month, and today we are going to be unapologetically centering Black experiences and celebrating its intersections. We invite our non-Black audience to honor these experiences and to reflect on the ways in which you can dismantle inequities, create access, and feel belonging. Now, virtual community and feelings of isolation in the workplace, these are not new concepts, especially for Black students and professionals. But the ongoing global pandemic has heightened those needs and those feelings. So this evening, our panelists, who uh, will introduce themselves shortly, will speak to the power of community and how they found it or built it in virtual spaces. And Don has here in the chat um, uh, thanking our graphic designer for Black, uh, Black History and Futures Month. Um, Anthony, so thank you so much for those beautiful graphics. Um, now, uh, for our panelists, if you could introduce yourselves in alphabetical order by first name and share in one word what community means to you. Um, so we'll have Ashley go first. I'm sorry, Boo, you're on mute. <laughs> I don't know that was gonna happen. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Walker. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a first year PhD student at Howard University and I'm the co-founder, I'm the founder of Black and Astro, co-founder of Black and Chem and Black and Physics. Um, what community means to me is family and finding, um, finding a group of people whom you continuously share experiences with, good, bad, and you all keep pushing forward. Love it, family. And if folks are resonating with that, um, feel free to put what you're feeling in the chat and never mind to put your questions in the QA. And so next up, we'll have Kaylee. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. So my name is Kaylee Arnold. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Um, I'm a disease ecologist, so I just study infectious diseases across different environmental landscapes. Um, and if I had to describe um, what community means to me in one word, I would say safety. One. And uh, Ruby. Hi, friends. Good evening. I'm Ruby Joy White. I use Prince and they, them pronouns. Apprentice because I exist on the spectrum of womanhood. And I'm also like a boy between like the age of 15 and 25. So think about all those things. That's kind of me. Um, I'm not a PhD student. Um, so that's really dope of you all. Um, but I am someone, I consider myself to be half creative, half sociologist. So I'm a social scientist. I study people, I study systems, I write about them, and then I create about them as well within my artistic practice. Uh, community to me, it was hard to, you know, think about it in one word. I'm, I'm a Sagittarius and we're extra. I'm gonna go for two, right? So I think about community in terms of accountability. Um, and I think about community in terms of ingenuity and moving within that ingenuity. Mm, those are great. I love it. Family, safety, ingenuity, and accountability. Um, thank you so much for those introductions. And I'm really thrilled to be sharing this space with all of you this evening. Um, yeah, so I have a few questions that I'd like to ask y'all. Um, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes before the top of the hour, we'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, uh, so a final reminder to the audience, if things are resonating with you, put them in the chat and want to see it. If you have questions for the panelists, put them in the Q&A because we also want to see those and address them while we're here together in this space. Um, so for this first question, and um, we'll kick it off with Ashley. When did you come, when did you first come to understand technology's power for community building? So I first 
found out when I had an, an unfortunate event that happened. And so with this unfortunate event, um, which is actually public, so it's not like it's a hush-hush it's secret like the FBI or anything like that, right? So unfortunately, um, a traumatic experience where my father was, um, where my father passed away of cancer and then I was mistakenly declared deceased by the US government. That's fun, right? <laughs> so <laughs> with this entire, and I hope I wasn't too fast for the interpreters, um, with this um with this experience right i then seen how so many people from across the world so many astronomers so many scientists regular people right that aren't scientists right um had donated to me for my gofundme page and so then i started gaining popularity from that point and I started meeting people and networking and so on and so forth. And so I saw how it affected me social media wise. And I was just like, oh, this is like a cool thing. And so this is something that was extremely helpful. And it 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 brought it brought me to where I am today. That is yeah, traumatic indeed. I can go next. Mm -hmm. if that's all right. Um, so I discovered the power of virtual community actually when I was really young. Um, I'm sure we all remember that wonderful website, blackplanet.com. <laughs> I discovered Black Planet when I was a mere youth, uh, probably like in seventh grade, I want to say. Um, and essentially, like I, I had always known that something was like different about me, right? Um, different than my peers, and I mean more so on like the queer spectrum. But I was, I was just trying to figure it out. Like talking about queerness and whatnot was like not a part of like you know the rhetoric of within my upbringing. Other things were, but not that specific thing. And so I was looking for um, people who maybe were similar to me, shared similar interests, and that's how I found myself on Black Planet. And then, of course, you know. Black Planet then merged over to my experience with MySpace. Uh, and then with MySpace, we have the whole Facebook thing, especially in college. And then where I really landed, I want to say, actually was in the Tumblr community. Um, and that's where I really started to see myself reflected, not just within like, um, like my Blackness, that was like a beautiful representation. But then I was able to connect with people who shared similar experiences regarding their gender identity, right? And their sexual orientation. And that was the first time that I actually felt very safe enough. Um, with people who actually looked like me in the areas that I was living in there weren't a lot of people who shared my identities like that and so being able to have access to these people at all times was a completely different experience and as a researcher and always researching and searching people and all that kind of thing um, it was really really important for me to be able to tap into different stories as a storyteller as well um, because I think it allowed me the ability to start reimagining what my future could look like with these health identities. And I think your social media definitely one of the biggest kind of players in, in that powerful community building aspect, for sure. Are you Kaylee? Um, so I think initially just thinking about like virtual community. Um, so I've moved around a lot um, since college and just doing grad school and, and moving for jobs. So um, just using virtual space is to maintain my community that I had growing up and keeping up with my friends, especially when you move to a new place and you haven't um, um, found your new community. And then I think um, more recently, and I think in a bigger way was just when COVID started. Um, and, and so funny enough, uh, so uh, I kind of got linked up with um, a bunch of black folks who are all naturalists or ecologist bird watchers and that's a space that is very white so it's hard to like find each other um just like in um, not online and then I kind of got linked up with them and we had a group chat that grew and I think it ended up being like maybe 60 of us and that was just a um a, something that I so not that anything about COVID was fun, but I think just of like in this like kind of like dark space that I definitely entered um, 
emotionally, but then I had like on my phone, I was interacting with six people, none of who I ever met in person, but who all shared my interests. So we could talk, we could, you know, get goofy and, um, and talk about like birds and fish. And um, I love marine mammals and I found black people who also love whales. So I think just um, that was a nice space and seeing the community and just how supportive we were. And also just like, just like a fun thing to do. We did some like game nights. Um, so I think just finding people and then building that community that I was not expecting um, was um, uh, helped me get through a lot of the early days of COVID. Mm -hmm. I definitely remember the days of writing friends addresses in a, in a book <laughs> to try to keep up. But um, again, that social media piece really making that so much easier to remind us that we're not alone. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really powerful thing. Um, the next question that I have for y'all, um, do you have different communities for different kind of aspects or facets of your life? So this is a two-parter, so that's one. And how do these different communities affirm maybe those different parts of you as much as you're comfortable sharing? And I think we saw a little bit of this, you know, um, Ruby was sharing a little bit about Tumblr and being able to have that as a safe space to explore um, the queer part of their identity. Um, I think that, like, for me, um, I have, like, again, different, like, like you said, different people, different places for, like, different things. And so for me, um, I got three mentors, right? And these beautiful souls serve different purposes, but at the same time, the same, they serve the same purpose, right? And they all know each other, right? And one of my mentors who is um, a little bit more senior, she's actually one of the first black women to receive a PhD in astronomy in the US. She, um, I'm sorry, they, sorry, let me get her pronouns, let me get their pronouns correct. They, um, they've been really, really helpful and actually just tweeted me today. It was like, I'm rooting for you, right? And so um, they mentor my other mentor. And so it's like one big happy family and it works out. And then I have my group of friends, right? That aren't academic, no, anything that I'm like, all right, y'all, let me tell y'all what happened. <laughs> right and we talk about all the good the good stuff and i be telling them all the tea that's going on in academia and i'd be like what girl what right and so and then obviously my family and i have two i have two sets of family right i have my biological family but i also have my science family mm -hmm. given and chosen Um, I can hop in next. Um, so I think just, uh, yeah, all the different facets of my life. So I have my community of grad students um, in my department and um, just of like, we all know what we're going through. Um, I'm a dancer. Um, so I, I spend a lot of time um, at my dance studio. And then so that's a whole community that I have, um, which has also been very, very fortunate to have um, through grad school. Um, and then also I, I made a, a group of friends of black women grad students um, at, from my university. So I'm not in their department, um, but so that was like a nice space to find of like people who share my identity um, and we have some interests, similar interests being in grad school. Um, and then also family, absolutely, um, of just that's my community. Um, when, whenever I can make it back home to California, um, it's a good uh, group of people to have. So I think for me, um, this was like a tricky question for me to kind of chew on because um, I'm a melter. And by that, I mean like everything in my, my life kind of melts together. Um, and so I don't really have like, I'm not like a person who compartmentalizes things. I wonder if that also has something to do with my neurodivergence, but I digress. I don't compartmentalize things and my worlds just kind of melt together. 
And so even though there are different facets to my life, right? Like I'm a creative, um, I'm a writer, I'm a researcher, um, I'm into music and dance and all of those things. It's still like, there's always a similar aspect to them all. And I share very much like even thinking about my group or my community of people, I always have them together. I rarely have little compartmentalized time with folks. And I think that um, that's something that I need in order for me to always feel whole in myself. And I've just noticed that about myself. So even if somebody doesn't have to do with another person or they know me from a different kind of world that I exist in, I still find a way to kind of melt them all together. And that's just a way for me to feel stable and um, cohesive within myself at all times. That's, uh, yeah, I, I love that. And I wonder, does that way of thinking of community for you, and I'll put you back on the spot, inform the work that you do? Yeah, I would certainly say so. Yeah, absolutely. I'm fascinated by people all the time, which is why like I study them. Um, and so I think that it makes for a fascinating time if I have different energies, you know, from different facets around me at the same time, melting those things together. Um, so that's just kind of like the mode that I exist in. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna keep picking on Ruby. Um, Cause I think, I think we can start this question with you. Um, especially because you've, you know, been able to meld these kind of different facets into um, kind of one community. What has building resilience in community looked like for you? That's a really big question. Um, and it could I'm be actually, maybe, oh, oh, you got it. Oh, go <laughs> I, um, I'm actually going through a pretty big life shift right now, um, just like my personal self. And so building resilience with community for me has mental exhibiting like a lot of vulnerability. Um, vulnerability in not always feeling strong, you know, challenging myself and like how Black femmes, Black women, and people who are socialized as women, right, are always supposed to be strong at all times, despite what's happening. Um, I think my past self would definitely try to hide those parts of myself. Um, and, but what I find is that like that strips away from the foundation of community. And I'm not showing up as who I am, even in those weak moments, even in those dark moments, that type of thing. Um, I've really been trying to hone in on embracing myself, no matter what it's appearing to be. And I think that that has allowed me to kind of build the scaffolding around my community to lean on during those times. Um, I think scaffolding is a really big word that I've been using a lot because it's about, you know, creating essentially that that wall of resilience so that we have that community to lean on no matter what and that we're able to show up there's that word again as our most ingenuous selves um and i think that without building that scaffolding it without being in that vulnerable space without just being me i don't think that resilience and accountability would come into play when it comes to defining what community is for me well, thank you for sharing yeah, I like that idea of, of, of scaffolding. And I wonder if it's something that resonates with Ashley or Kaylee, or if um, maybe you have a, a different um, maybe perspective or take. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I, that actually kind of makes me um, think and, and uh, so I have like separate communities that I don't like, they don't really interact together. And I think about like me as a whole person, um, who do I lean on? I don't, so I, so perhaps, um, maybe it's, uh, just thinking about resilience and, and how to, um, find who to lean on has made me think about it a lot of like, oh, I have to kind of pick and choose. Um, but I guess kind of on that, um, thinking about like, who I fully am, I suppose. And like, maybe just like the, I'm thinking, do I, do I identify as a scientist or am I a person who does science? Am I a person who dance? So just kind of thinking about like, how do I really kind of think about myself and then who like most maybe kind of fits that mold, even if they're not exactly the same, but can like knows you know, can kind of, um, I guess, deal with me as that full person. So I guess, um, uh, not really answering the question, but it is making me think about um, 
who, or even just like which communities maybe um, I can lean on more or um, can um, maybe make like try to prioritize a little bit more because um, they'll be the ones um, who can support me fully. Mm -hmm. Or just in the way that you needed at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with Haley <laughs> on that one. Cause that's, that's like really, really, that's like really, really hard, right? But um, but I kind of lean on everybody. So like 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 and it and it kind of works, right? It, it kind of works. Like I, I like I was crying crying to you, Isabel, yesterday about this proposal, <laughs> and I'm still upset about it, right? <laughs> so like it, you know, what I'm saying it works, right? Mm -hmm. And like I I get the support, like. Even if they, even if like, for example, my mom or my best friend may not understand, right? They know like, this is a thing and this is what we need to support her, so. So this next question, and I think Ashley, because you, you mentioned um, mentors, I'll, I'll uh, toss this one to you first. Um, what role do you think mentorship can play in community spaces? And I guess that can kind of more broadly be thought of kind of beyond maybe academic spaces or beyond relationships that you have directly with mentors um, or advisors? Yeah, it definitely depends on you, right? And, and, and that's what I typically tell people um, when I do like tell friends who don't have any at all, I'll literally force them by hand if they go get you one because you're going to need it right? Everybody needs somebody, right? And um, I think that, like, depending on, like, where you are in your life, um, it depends on where people fit. Mm -hmm. So, like, again, one of my mentors who I'm really close with, she's not only my mentor, she's my big sister and my friend. So she gonna keep it 100 with me all day. Like she gonna, she gonna, she not gonna sugarcoat nothing, right? But academically, I have another mentor who I also call my big sister, right? But she is making sure I gotta get to where I gotta go. Um, and helping me like go through these milestones. So it definitely depends on, um, on you and how, how, how like all of that plays a part in where you are in life. Now, um, maybe flip this question back on own itself. Um, do you see yourself as a mentor in, in the communities that you're a part of? Mm. <laughs> now, why would you ask that question? somebody literally called me that yesterday and I was just like what I just give you advice <laughs> that's literally what I was like literally that's what I was thinking I like I never really fully see myself as a mentor but when other people like call me that I'll be like oh I have students right so it kind of like pulls at the heartstrings a little bit so like right now I'm making sure a student like ask all the questions for grad school. Um, another student who's trying to get into undergrad, um, making sure that like their essays are completed and you know they're getting the acceptances and so on and so forth. And even with my little cousin, right, who's five years old, who thinks I'm eight. And she, you know, she called me today about a birthday party. So, and I'm mentoring her on growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I have been spending some time thinking about the word mentor and mentorship. Um, I'm actually somebody who hasn't had like what we would consider mentors, you know, a lot throughout my life. And actually I know that to be true about a lot of like black women, black femmes is that it's kind of like you're just thrown into the world and you're trying to figure it out by yourself and good luck. We always figure it out though. I'm going to go ahead and throw that out. Um, but 
really, I have been really trying to distill the word mentorship. And I find that it doesn't need to look like how I thought it was supposed to look. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really helpful for me. I would even use the word liberating because then I've been able to find mentorship or aspects of it in so many different facets, right? Um, so I have spent some time working in higher education and directed a, a cultural center on a college campus for a number of years. And those students would say that I'm a mentor to them. And then I'm going to go ahead and flip in and say that they're a mentor to me. And so then I started to think about what I want mentorship to look like. And I actually very much appreciate having folks who are 10 years my junior and folks who are 10 years my senior um, mentoring me because I'm getting different things from it. And I think that that's how mentorship is supposed to work. In fact, I'm a really big fan of like intergenerational friendships and things like that, because we all learn all kinds of different things and we're able to develop each other in different ways. Um, and then I would also want to say that finding mentorship in all of my facets, whether that's, you know, my creative facet or like when I'm doing my social research and whatnot, I find mentorship in even the things that I read or some authors that I appreciate and things like that. So it doesn't need to be one person who has a specific presence in my life. It can be from something that I appreciate or something that has moved me or something that I maybe watched or listened to. And so I think if we can expand on what that word mentorship means, um, it will allow us to have greater resource to people who can help develop us, even if we don't know them personally. Um, although I think all is, is um, important, having people who are physically in your space or available to you, but finding those, those other ways, especially if it's not as accessible, which for so many of us, it hasn't been. Mm -hmm. I, and I really like that piece on, you know, the, the person doesn't have to physically be there. And it, it brings up for me a bit of a, uh, a bit of kind of bell hooks thinking, right? You know, being able to find that mentorship just through reading and um, yeah, that's a bit of it. That's you, Kayla. Um, so I, um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, made me think even more. Um, I, I think just, I would say um, kind of like help like guiding you. And then so I think kind of like what Ruby was saying is, um, yeah, kind of, even if they're um, like uh, younger than you or older, and, and I think just thinking about like, okay, in this moment, um, we're in this space, um, what don't I know? Who can perhaps provide me with some of the, um, I don't know, direction or help or any kind of advice? And that can come from a lot of different um um, I guess, types of people. So I think I'll just say that. I think it's, um yeah, I think just, um, um, keeping an open mind of who can help you kind of move in some sort of direction of moving forward. Um, this, is, this is so great. And I <laughs> am sad that we are already on our last question. Um, and I'm gonna say one, but you can feel free to throw out as many as you'd like. Um, what is a piece of advice given all of this uh, brilliant wisdom coming from this panel? What is one piece of advice or two or you know that you'd have for somebody on how to build virtual community if they find themselves in a situation where they're feeling isolated? Um, I can start. Um, I think I would say is um, think about uh, maybe like interests, hobbies, um, something about yourself. Um, so my like I would be looking for dancers or I'm looking for ecologists. Um, but I think starting there um, and then even just like going through Google and seeing uh, maybe if there's spaces that already exist. Um, or, or maybe you can kind of connect with a few individuals. I know, I think we can all speak to Twitter. Um, I think that's a great uh, place to find even like a single individual who's um, has some similar interests as you and um, maybe try to reach out or even just express like, hey, like I would love to um, meet other folks who, uh, dancers and like dancer scientists or, or just <laughs> something there. Yeah, I would build off of what Kaylee said. That was the first thing that came to my mind is figuring out what what are your hobbies or interests, right? Because that's like the easiest way to begin to tap into something or 
if you're watching a show and like, I'm glad that you referenced Twitter, just use the hashtag because more often than not, somebody's going to be watching that show and you can build community <laughs> that way. But really, um, what I like to do is find pieces of myself that I'm afraid to explore. And I like to actually explore what virtual community can look like in those spaces, because that's a less, I want to say, fronting space, right? If I'm able to just build a virtual community, these people are not like a part of my everyday life and whatnot. I'm able to explore a side of myself that I've been afraid to explore, but there are so many different resources, so many different people um, from all over the world as well. So you never know how you're going to be able to find comfort in that and security in that identity um, or in a thought that you might have. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been challenging myself to do more. And I think that it's creating other like portals into things that have to do with me that I didn't really know were there. And for you, does that building community look like reaching out to like existing communities and trying to tap into those? And Absolutely. All right, Ashley, do you have some piece of advice for, for folks wanting to build virtual community? Everything I have done has been on accident. <laughs> I just want to say that it has been on accident. It has never been on purpose, right? It has always been me either being the feisty little angry person or, um, or probably me yelling about um, my future ex-husband, baby's father, Michael B. Jordan. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to just throw that in there. Um, something. Something. It, it'd be something, right? I was waiting on that one. You know, ever since he tweeted me, man. Mm. So, <laughs> that's a true story, y'all. It's a true story. So, <laughs> with that being said, with all of that being said, right, on a serious note, like building community is just really um, what Kaylee and Ruby said, basically putting yourself out there, right? Um, me, I like to literally go and be like, who is this person? Oh, okay, I'm gonna go see what they do. do, do, do. Go on the internet, Google them, see what they about. Okay, hey, I'm just gonna uh, email you. How you doing? My name is Ashley. This is what I do, blah, blah, blah. And if if they heard of like some of the work of the community that I've already built, I'd, I'd invite, I typically invite them to join us, right? And, 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 and come have fun and, and just relax and be themselves because I'm, I'm pretty sure nine out of 10, it's somebody with the same similar black background as you. And that has really, really helped a lot of people. Um, especially with the Black and X movement that has like really, really like helped us all together, like in, and also the Black and STEM movement as well, um, its predecessor. So it has been like really, really, really helpful for all of us. And I'm realizing that the, the question that I posed originally had the word build in it, but I think the three of you all kind of spoke to the fact that yes, you can build it. And also there are spaces that exist. You just have to find them and tap in versus having to necessarily build it up from scratch. Um, oh, this was so great. Thank y'all so much. Um, we do have a few uh, questions posed in the Q&A. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to get to all of them, but I'll see what we can do. Um, and yeah, I think for these, I'll throw them out there and kind of Again, that popcorn style, um, whoever feels uh, kind of called to, to speak on it. Um, so we have one question from Anita Kakona who asks, have any of you created your own community? So I think we can kind of segue in um, from, our, from our last question. Uh. Yes, I have. <laughs> I have. I've created maybe four of them, five. I don't, I don't, I, I can't keep up count at this point. Um, but, um, and Isabel's actually a part of two of them. <laughs> so, um, yes, 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 yes. And it works. It really, really, it, it, it really does work because then people become friends and then somebody moves to another state. I'm using you as an example. Um, 
<laughs> you know, now they they friends and they talk on the phone all the time, and and it it, it really works. It really really does, and it's also helpful when you're trying to like get stuff done and you all have the same common goal. Um, and also just and just deciding to live or even having a book club or whatever the case it may be, that also comes into play too, because you never know what like like-minded interests pop up. So yes, yes, it has really been, it's been one of the best things in my career so far. And maybe um, if you also wanted to drop maybe some of those in the chat for folks um, who might be interested to see what Black and X, Black and Astro, Black and Physics, all of these things are all about. Mm. Mm. Okay. I'm sorry, she got a follow up or they've got a follow up. They don't have their pronouns on there. Um, how do you implement? family, safety, accountability, all of these things that we've talked about. Um, so maybe um, pairing these two together, if you've created your own community, how did you do these things? Or maybe if you're a part of a community um, or if in your own kind of spaces, how do you do this? <laughs> it's always that word right <laughs> well I don't know about anybody else but I'm a straight shooter I, I just go for it right and like sometimes it's it's, you, it's those difficult conversations but they help all of us grow so um, for me, I've had to have those difficult conversations, um, especially with my vice president <laughs> and like holding me accountable for things. And I'm just like, dang, okay, okay, okay. I'll get on it. I'll do this, you know, or there's been difficult conversations where we're like, Hey, we can't associate with this person, blah, 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 blah. And those are, those are like real conversations. And so, um, even with like dealing with whether it's, you know, the academic family or your friends you call your family, your family, your biological family, right? These are all difficult conversations that need to be had because how else, again, going back to growing, you're like a flower. How else will you grow? Um, I'll just hop in real fast. Um, um, one of the virtual, um, groups I was in, it was um, Black in Microbiology, so a bunch of Black microbiologists, but they just, um, the founders had a code of conduct, and I think that's, it, it felt a little like, oh, like, I thought we were friends, but it was, like, really necessary, and, like, I've also been in a, um, another group that um, once um, uh, kind of grew in popularity, and then um, some, like, um, some, like, kind of toxic traits came out, um, but mm -hmm. so having a code of conduct, sort of like nip that in the bud. So um, sometimes that's kind of necessary to try to, in, in terms of like at least like safety and, and kind of accountability there. And I'll jump in there and also say um, creating some sort of like community agreements. So if you are like meeting as a group, like in a specific space, the creation of that so that you will always fall back to it and that you're always reciting it at the beginning is gonna help um, definitely keep folks safe or as safe as you possibly can in that space 100%. Right. I, I feel like we have, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze in one more question. Not everybody has to answer this one um, because I do see um, that Irene Evans is also here. So we'll give her some uh, a space to, to speak. Um, so I'll try to, try to be, so Anthony asks, um, Anthony Olivia, and this was in regards to being in multiple communities. So he writes, as a large black man, through my life I've been taught to be a social chameleon, being careful about how I interact with individuals around me, depending on the setting. I was wondering if anyone has had to go through the same type of chameleon-like movement 
and challenges and what those experiences are like. Has virtual community helped you combat that? Um, and he says that he comes from a sports background, um, so he's very uh, interested in what y'all have to say. I too come from a sports background, so I feel you on that. <laughs> so is it more so like the code switching type of thing? Is what I'm is what I'm is, is what I'm sensing. Because that can I mean, that could, that that could be probably yeah. could be yeah. yeah I could yeah I could definitely yeah because I've had people tell me oh you can't act this way or you have to present yourself a certain tone or talk a certain way I'm gonna be me uh, I'm gonna be me all day every day so in 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 social media you know, they can, it can play a huge role in boosting your confidence about being in your blackness, right? And that's something that you want to walk in confidence in. And Anthony says, I dig it. So it sounds like you kind of hit the right, the right thing. Yeah. Ruby or Kaylee, y'all want to jump in? And if not, it's also good. But I will say that you do see a little bit of that on social media, a little bit of people trying to kind of put you in your place. Um, but I think, like Ashley said, it is a lot easier to kind of stay in your own seat of power. Um, I think I'll just say, like, to be honest, so I think in virtual spaces, I think I've just found people who are, um, like, share my identities um, so I can be more like myself and not have to kind of try to fit a mold but to be honest I have not figured out how to do that in like real spaces um so that's something I'm kind of working on so I have like the comfort of virtual spaces and then still being a chameleon in a lot of my life I think that um this was an interesting one for me to think about is because I think that with all my held identities um, for safety, it's encouraged that I become a chameleon sometimes. Um, but because of who I am innately, I don't really become a chameleon. And what that's done is caused a lot of folks to actually be uncomfortable um, with, with my confidence in who I am, despite say like marginalization. I see this a lot too when I do, um, I do a lot of equity work as well. And um, when I'm working with a lot of organizations that are like um, white dominant or have dominant identities and whatnot, the way in which I deliver material is not really that happy-go-lucky, like, oh, yes, I like to say with the side of milk, I usually say that I'm deliver with the side of milk. And I think that that's sometimes threatening to people um, because everything would point to marginalization, right? And so within marginalization, it's sometimes encouraged for you to put your head down and just go with the flow, but I've never been like that. I would say that I kind of go against the grain on purpose. And sometimes I would say that that's, you know, provided a lot of difficulty in my life when having to navigate, you know, spaces and systems, but I'm just going to be frank. I'll be damned if I'll be any other way. Um, and that's just how it is. Now, I know that a lot of us don't have the safety in, in even saying that, even though within marginalization, I have a lot of privilege within marginalization based on how I look and all those other kinds of things, the way that I speak, et cetera. Um, but I believe that it was shared even in the Q&A, Anthony shared it, you know, um, I am my ancestor's wildest dreams. Yeah, and that is to be who you are um, despite the space and to stand in that bravery at all times. So that's just kind of my advice is to stand in that bravery because you have nothing to lose and this is your life. Nobody else can live it. So well said. Um, all right, so we were given the green light for one more question. Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. All right, I'm gonna do this one. Um, so Kareen had mentioned the phrase that uh, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, and she says that she finds herself doing things and thinking in ways that are different than um, her parents. And so what's your advice for bridging the gap between what Blackness meant for our parents and um, the reality that we're just Black and we don't have to adhere to any ideas of what Blackness looks like. Um, so what, what does that um, maybe 
those differences in perspectives look like? Um, or do they exist for you in your family? Can I take this first? Um, I was very fortunate enough to grow up in a very pro-Black household. Um, so my parents um, guided my siblings and I into really, really positive, I want to say, uh, development of Blackness. And so like that has always been a very strong value of mine. Um, it, you know, being told, growing up, being told like, your black is beautiful. You can do these things, um, that your blackness doesn't stand in the way. And that it's like an, in a, in a, a great addition to who you are as a person, I think has allowed me to move in spaces kind of like the way that I just described. Um, and I know that a lot of folks in our community don't actually have that. That's not like, um, the place in which they come from. And so I think in one way I'm advantaged, but because of that, I sometimes have to check myself and realize that not everybody in our community is like that. And then what do I need to do within having this held sense of awareness, this proud sense of awareness? What do I need to do to be, make sure that I'm creating a container of nourishment and support for other Black diasporic people who you know, don't exist in those modes? Um, and so that's something that I've been trying to practice and really think about because in my mind, I'm like, no, we're Black. Like we're all here, that this is how you should feel about yourself. Now take a step back because context is everything. Uh, and then regarding, you know, taking into consideration my parents' cultural context, it's completely different. Um, they grew up with completely different messaging than we did, right? And so I, I think about that and I think about how sometimes they had to code switch out of safety or they had to do certain things, but they instilled in my siblings and I something completely different. So how do I hold both of those things as true? Um, and I do that when I'm making sure that I'm pivoting to that space of nourishment for the folks who are not there yet within uh, the, their, their strong awareness of self and their appreciation of self. And then that, that social and historical context is so important. And it was really great to have that, that reminder, um, kind of moving into this question. Um, I can be really quick and kind of add, so I think, um, how, I grew up, so um, my parents uh, really had to do kind of be chameleons and my dad is very big in respectability politics. So that's uh, a whole thing kind of um, dealing with as I get older and trying to push back on that. Um, but I would say, and even kind of keeping with theme, I think these virtual spaces has um, made it easier for me to kind of embrace my blackness and be unapologetically black um, because I'm around more people that were at least virtually, more people that share my identity. Um, I grew up, um, I just exist in a lot of white spaces, so it wasn't something that I had when I was younger. So um, I've been empowered with these virtual spaces that now I have been able to bring into my like daily life. Um, so that's something that's um, been helpful. Hey, Ashley, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? So I grew up, um, I grew up kind of weird because one half of my life I was around um, white people and then the other half, the majority of the half, I grew up around black people, right? And so um, because I would live in one, I would live in like a predominantly white area where I was like one of maybe three people on the block that was black, but I went to school in the hood. <laughs> So it kind of, it, it balanced itself out on its own. And so um, for me, my grandparents, they were always, they were very similar to Kaylee with the chameleon and the, um, and the respectability politics, um, especially my grandfather. And, and as my mom get, is getting older, my mother. But, but when she was younger, she was a little bit, she was way more radical. Um, but however, me, on the other hand, I'm extremely radical. So I'm, I'm not, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just here, right? I just, I just exist. And so, um, the, my family dynamic is a little bit different because it's like one half is, is, is radical, which is me and like the guys in the family. And then everyone else is just like timid or, um, more so um, 
more so catering, if, 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 if I must use a word, right? More so catering to, to that, um, mm -hmm. to the similar way that my grandparents were. So um, it's, definitely, it's definitely a thing. And so we're just trying to figure out like now, like how to balance it. Well, thank you. And I, I really wish that we could hold more space for this. Um, this has been incredible. Unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour.